Okay, so welcome you all again to this live practice session for the Applied Environmental Microbiology course. I am Guru Priya and uh, I am a Prime Minister Research Fellow in the Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras. So, okay, let's get started with the session. So, yeah, week 3 course content, uh, it was dealing with, again, energetics and metabolism and uh, microbial uh, diversity. Uh, so I'll also, I also have a few questions for discussion based on that only and then in the meanwhile we'll be clarifying your doubts also. Okay, so the first question for the day. You can start answering. Yeah, I have got one answer. I guess more people can try this. This is like a warm-up question. Okay, right, let's see the answer. Yeah, uh, basically the Krebs cycle is aerobic because uh, it requires aerobic condition, but it uh, neither consumes oxygen nor oxygen acts as a catalyst in that process. So A is the right option. We'll go to the next question now. Which of the following doesn't occur until the Krebs cycle? Yeah. Right. Right. So this is great. I've gotten many responses. So as all of you have said, it's oxidative phosphorylation. So basically oxidative phosphorylation occurs after the Krebs cycle. So uh, it doesn't occur until the Krebs cycle. So that's the right answer. The third question is, what is pyruvic acid in respiration? Okay, there are two responses and two different responses. I'll give you some more time and wait for a few more responses from you. Again, it's a tie between B and D now. Okay. I 
I think you are pretty sure that it's not A and C. So it's between B and D now. Anyone who thinks it's A, C, or even B or D, I'll wait for a few more responses. Okay, I guess you are confused now. Can I get a few more uh, responses from remaining people also? Whatever you think is more appropriate, even though if you are confused. Okay. Right, so with that, let's see the answer. It's B. Uh, why not D will be the first question like pondering in your mind. So, yeah, I asked what is pyruvic acid in respiration. I could also change this question as what is pyruvic acid in fermentation. So, basically, respiration and fermentation depends on presence of oxygen or uh, or availability of oxygen is there or not okay but pyruvic acid is not formed only when oxygen is available glycolysis happens either ways uh, when you are going to uh, do a respiration or a fermentation glycolysis happens there uh, so when it's going to be glycolysis uh, the series of 10 steps again leads us to a product called pyruvic acid so pyruvic acid is formed be it respiration or fermentation be it oxygen is available or when oxygen is not available okay so the right answer would be uh, we, we all know that uh, glycolysis happens so it's not a protein breakdown again it's not a product of a krebs cycle but in turn this uh, moves to krebs cycle for further metabolism uh, so obviously uh, pyruvic acid uh, breaks down into two carbon fragments in carbon dioxide so that is the right answer i guess it's uh, clear for you all like those who are uh, said D. Do you, if you have any uh, opinions on it, you can put it in the chat box. I'll wait for a few minutes. If it's clear, just give a yes. Or uh, if you feel it's still contradicting, you can. Okay. Right. So, yeah, with that. I understand uh, like everyone's clear now so I'll move to the fourth question Okay, there are three responses. I guess this is a pretty straightforward question. So, okay, fine. So, can someone tell me what are the two phases of glycolysis? Right. 
right. Yes, with that, like I'll just close that. See, is the answer. Of course, glycolysis does not occur in the mitochondrial matrix, but where does glycolysis occur? I guess I told this last week. Within the cell, uh, yeah, it happens in the cytosol. And as discussed in the previous question, glycolysis happens whether it's aerobic or anaerobic condition. And yeah, energy investment phase states that there is consumption of energy. But when you are calculating, the net ATP will be gained. That doesn't mean there is no ATP being spent in glycolysis. So we spend a few ATP molecules and gain more than that so that our net uh, ATP is uh, in gain. Okay. So yes, the next question. Which of the following pathways involve carbohydrate metabolism? Again, just to clarify, if people are not aware of what these short forms mean or something, um, just let it be. I'll explain what it is in a few minutes. So if you get the context of this question, give me the answer. Otherwise, like wait so that I'll discuss the answers. Okay, the people who have answered, can you tell me what is EMP, HMP, ED? Okay, let me first ask what EMP is. Ah, right. Right, Shagupta Khan has answered it right. It's EMP stands for Emden Mayerhoff Parnas Pathway. Okay. Right, HMP, Hexose Monophosphate Pathway, and ED, Entner Dordrop Pathway. So EMP stands for Emden Mayerhoff Parnas Pathway. So that is EMP. And all of this involve carbohydrate metabolism. Um, mostly EMP pathway is the most common pathway. But in some organisms, you can also find the uh, ED pathway for glycolysis. So these both deals with glucose metabolism. And uh, hexose monophosphate pathway, uh, that is a very different case of uh, carbohydrate metabolism involved in microorganisms okay so all of the all of them are carbohydrate metabolic pathways so the next question uh, as said earlier i'll discuss all these questions with uh, appropriate diagrams and stuff so we'll just practice for a few minutes and then go with that. Right, pretty easy question. I expect more people to answer fast. Right, so that's a pretty straightforward question. So, okay. 
now coming to the uh, metabolic pathway here so the diagram on the uh, top left in your screen is the glycolysis pathway um, maybe if you are interested like i can explain this uh, like first glycolysis as the name suggests is the breakdown of glucose so you are going to um, derive energy by breaking down glucose how do you go about this first of all there is an expenditure of energy that is you take up uh, take up an atp and uh, there is a removal of uh, this one phosphate group in it and attachment of that to the uh, glucose so it becomes glucose 6 phosphate glucose 6 phosphate as we have discussed earlier um, what is glucose 6 phosphate like under what did we see glucose 6 phosphate Additional phosphate group to sixth carbon position. Yeah, uh, what compound it is like based on previous sessions? Like, we have seen it under energy rich compounds, so it is again a highly energy rich compounds. Now, you will understand that energy rich compounds are basically phosphorylated, so the phosphate bond addition gives them that energy. Uh, and then after that, this glucose 6-phosphate, uh, we know glucose uh, and fructose are isomers. So using uh, this isomerase enzyme, the isomers are generated. And again, after that, there is one more phosphorylation that is on the first position. So now it becomes uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So from this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we can get glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. But uh, the glycolysis that we study here further moves upon with glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate only. Uh, so, to, in order to convert this glyceraldehyde, uh, sorry, dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, we again use an isomerase enzyme. See, these both are isomers as we told glucose 6 phosphate and fructose 6 phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphates are. Uh, uh, they also are isomers so we use triose phosphate isomerase here and uh, the interconversion happens so again glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate uh, becomes 13 uh, bisphosphoglycerate okay so again there is a phosphorylation happening here but here uh, this is a substrate level phosphorylation so there is no atp uh, involved there is a direct phosphorylation here and then we uh, move about with uh, removal of a phosphate so ATP is again formed here uh, and then we get 3 phosphoglycerate again uh, this structure gets uh, mutated and we get a 2 phosphoglycerate which in turn forms phosphoenol pyruvate we have again seen this as an energy rich compound we have seen a glucose 6 phosphate and this phosphoenol pyruvate under the energy rich uh, as examples of energy rich compounds in our previous sessions okay uh, so again pyruvate kinase enzyme so basically you know kinase enzyme deals with this uh, involvement of atp so here you again generate an atp from by phosphorylating an adp and you get this pyruvate what do we do is generally this pyruvate in aerobic condition goes here to the Krebs cycle. Okay, so here what happens is in the first step, uh, this pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme acts here. Carbon dioxide is released as we saw in one question. Carbon dioxide is released and acetyl-CoA is uh, formed. Okay, uh, so here what do we do is with uh, this acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate are the starting uh, point of this Krebs cycle where they both form the, all these compounds here and finally again oxaloacetate is regenerated so that is why we call this as a Krebs cycle it goes like this from citrate, cis saponitate, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate etc and finally what happens is we again generate oxaloacetate which helps in uh, this uh, which helps in the repetition of uh, this Krebs cycle over and over again. Uh, so in this also, you can see the energetics of this uh, pathway here. You can see you have an NADH released here. You have an uh, NADH released here when it is forming uh, alpha ketoglutarate from isocitrate. And uh, more importantly, you can see uh, when the conversion happens from succinyl-CoA to succinate, uh, you get an... Um, 
GDP. Okay, so with all this, now you can see the energetics of this process in this table, where in the glycolysis uh, stage, a uh, first, I mean, until this part, right, where this. Uh, two compounds are formed this is called the uh, preparatory phase okay so in the preparatory phase you can see two atp is consumed whereas in the payoff phase uh, or further downstream from here this is called the payoff phase so when you divide glycolysis into two uh, the first phase is called the preparatory phase where atp is consumed and after that atp uh, is being formed so that is called the payoff phase in that four atp is uh, formed so from glycolysis we again get two nadh molecules and then uh, there is uh, like pyruvate metabolism using krebs cycle um, so here you can see that in the krebs cycle six nadh is formed two atp is formed and two FADH2 are formed. So um, totally if you are going to calculate like what is the ATP yield, it will be 38. Okay, that is the aerobic uh, respiration pathway. Uh, so yes. And this will be our electron transport chain further. Mm, so before uh, going into the electron transport chain, like can you answer uh, where does the electron transport chain occur? Right, right. Okay, coming on to uh, this particular course and this particular session, where does uh, electron transport chain occur? I'll wait for responses from a few more people. If it's my, even if it's mitochondria, if it's the same answer, you can still answer. I'll just see how many people are knowing it. Mitochondrial membrane, mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so our course deals with microbiology. Uh, so we have both prokaryotes and eukaryotes uh, in our study. But still, uh, like when we talk about microbiology, like maybe most evidently you tend to assume them as prokaryotes. Though you have uh, eukaryotes also in microbiology. Right, plasma membrane and prokaryotes. Huh, so that is what you you have to think about. Okay, so when asked about where does uh, electron transport chain happens, we instantly start answering it as mitochondrial membrane. But in case of prokaryotes, we are entirely going to deal this course mostly with bacterium, archaea and stuff, right? So when I think bacteria will be the most common uh, discussion topic in this particular course. So with respect to that, the electron transport chain basically occurs in the cytoplasmic membrane. The only reason is that we know that uh, prokaryotes lack membrane bound organelles and that term membrane bound is the key term where uh, we know all these membrane bound are going to have a phospholipid bilayer. Okay. So it, now, if you see on the picture on the left, uh, you see that this is what you told, like the mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane. Yeah, it's a phospholipid uh, bilayer. When you come to the picture on the right side, you can again see a similar pattern, a uh, phospholipid bilayer, but this bilayer is the plasma membrane of the prokaryotic cell because prokaryotes contain uh, this membrane only in their plasma membrane they don't have any other membrane bound organelles okay um, so i think this is clear when with res respect to uh, prokaryotes it's going to be 
plasma membrane of the cell itself otherwise in eukaryotes where mitochondria is present it's going to be mitochondrial membrane um, basically what's the difference between the uh, two is uh, generally we tend to discuss this eukaryotic where we talk about this complex one complex two all these stuff uh, whereas you can see here in prokaryote there is a slight difference in the proteins that are involved and the mechanism uh, there is no difference fundamentally in the principles that is happening but there is a slight functional uh, variation or the there is a variation in what proteins are present uh, and where the uh, process takes place okay so i wanted to highlight this i guess you are clear with what is happening that is the proton motor force uh, being uh, the driving force for this electron transport chain where when there is a proton concentration gradient across the membrane uh, there will be a pathway for which this proton to uh, come inside uh, so that the concentration gradient is fixed so that medium through which this concentration gradient is fixed is called the atp synthase so it acts like a rotor basically wherein in order to uh, uh, bring this concentration gradient to equilibrium uh, there will be uh, some mechanism with this enzyme you know this is a maybe uh, as we have studied it's a quaternary structure because we find many tertiary structures being attached to each other we find many subunits in this atp synthase so it will be a quaternary structure protein here this is again a protein so this protein will uh, drive this uh, formation of atp which is an energy rich uh, molecule and which is commonly termed as the energy currency of our cell okay and additional information which is given in this picture and maybe uh, it's good to know that uh, where are proton motor forces used is proton motor force is not only used here in this uh, atp synthesis process it is also used in active transport we know that active and passive transporting uh, maybe in passive you don't need any uh, energy uh, it's just the concentration gradient that drives but when the concentration gradient uh, uh, sorry when the movement is against the concentration gradient you need some driving force for the transport to happen so that is known as active transport and even in that you can proton motor force is used and again for flagellar movement also this uh, again this is a rotor movement like this like the rotary movement of this atp synthase rotation of flagella is also a rotary movement so in that the proton motor force is used this is just an additional information since we learn microbiology okay so now um maybe the maybe i'll come to the question that pallavi has uh, pallavi can you pre, uh, tell me by unmuting yourself what's your question exactly Uh, you mean that uh, uh, oh that's an assignment question right which week assignment and what's the question number are you talking about the problem that was given in one of the assignments uh, with the del g formula okay second week question 6 okay i'll uh, for now post the next question for you to uh, think upon an answer and in the meantime i'll look at i'll take a look at the question okay so yes for now uh, you guys answer this question and yes
Is this, this question tough? I see no responses in the chat box. Just think, think about what you have learnt in the past two weeks. Question 5 is visible, right? Okay, okay, I'm getting a response. Right. So I guess this question was pretty tough. So in the RKL membrane, we find L glycerol and ether linkage. Okay, I guess most of you would have known the answer is between B and D and are confused if it's either B or D. So now uh, just remember, it's it's just a fact that uh, RKL membrane has L glycerol in it. Can we move on to the next question? Am I audible? Okay. Okay, we'll move on to the next question then. Okay. I think I had only one question about this RKL membrane. Um, I'll explain about this and in the meantime you can answer this question. right as you have all answered it right uh, we know that SO4 2 minus can be used as an electron acceptor in anaerobic respiration in some facultative bacteria uh, what does facultative bacteria mean
or a facultative anaerobe in particular means what does it mean not restricted to a particular environment Okay, yeah. It needs oxygen for its survival but can undergo fermentation in the absence of oxygen. Yes. Uh, so the term facultative in general means it can facilitate its growth in either of the environment. Ah, bacteria can switch to fermentation and oxygen is not present. Yeah. So it can facilitate its growth in either of the environments. Okay. Uh, that is called facultative. Uh, when it is not facultative but it's very sensitive to a particular environment what do we call it these are very basic term in microbiology which you have to be clear about I asked a very simple question, right? When it's not like, when it is strictly requires something, I'm telling the term, when it strictly requires some nutrient, what do we call? Yeah, obligate. Mm, right. So you have to be clear about these terms. Like you, you should be pretty clear that obligate is something that strictly requires a particular nutrient or a particular condition in case of facultative it can facilitate its growth in either of the conditions okay so pallavi to your question about that uh, problem yeah uh, you I just uh, saw the problem now. Uh, so in that problem, what you have to do is you have to find, uh, use the number of microbes that is given and find uh, the rate constant, right? Like per day, what, what will be the value? Uh, so that question, I guess I cannot use my pen now uh, in the screen. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, once this session is over, maybe within, uh, half an hour I will just uh, work that uh, some maybe and uh, let you know I I think you have posted the same question in the discussion forum also right okay okay so with this question like uh, let me move to the previous slide here to just explain about this RKL membrane I guess there was one question in the discussion forum regarding this RKL membrane also um, Last week, yeah, I told, uh, maybe at the end of the session, I told about this uh, RKL membrane thing. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, as you can see in this picture, uh, this one, the top one is the RKL membrane and the bottom one is the normal uh, bacterial membrane. Okay. Uh, you can see that there is a presence of L-glycerol. That was the question, right? L glycerol and uh, ether link, which is present in this RKL membrane. So the top part, part here is the RKL membrane, uh, and here the bottom part is the bacterial membrane. Okay. Uh, you have glycerol, and you can see the orientation. You know that uh, D A and L are uh, isomers, right? So you can see there is a difference in orientation. This difference in orientation only brings about the difference in this bond also. You can see here where the oxygen of uh, this fatty acid chain is linked to. And here you can see uh, where the linkage is. So that to, that basically brings about the difference between the ether linkage and the, and the uh, ester linkage. Okay. So 
and the other major difference as you can see is here you can see the presence of branched isoprene chains whereas here you can see unbranched fatty acids so let's see what exactly this uh, confers to the archaea uh, the chirality of uh, glycerol as discussed you can see uh, glycerol with phosphate added to one end and two side chains added to other end so that is what we call a, a phospholipid basically but in bacteria you can see there is a d glycerol and archaea there is a l glycerol uh, remember uh, remember this thing archaea has a l glycerol whereas normal bacteria generally has a d glycerol and the uh, ether linkage you can see uh, the side chain that is added has two oxygen atom attached to one end here okay uh, so sorry here uh, one of these oxygen atom is used to form link with glycerol and the other protrudes to the side uh, as you can see right so this is what we call a ester linkage c o and c, double bond o here but here you can see it's only c bond o remember this structure so that uh, you answer any question regarding this plasma membrane of archaea or bacteria and coming to this isoprenoid chains the side chains in bacteria are usually fatty acids and that contain 16 to 18 carbon atoms okay whereas in archaea it contains side chains of 20 carbon atoms it's not a very hard and fast rule that it should contain 20 carbon atoms but in general we tell an average of about 20 carbon atoms form this isoprene chain okay um, and the branching of side chain is the important factor here. Archaeal side chains have a different physical structure because isoprene is used to build the side chains and there are side branches of the main chain. Here you can find no branches. What does this branch, branches do? The fatty acids of, uh, they can bring about like connection between these two uh, chains also which will confer much more stability so now you know why archaea is majorly present in extremophilic conditions as you see uh, maybe a thermophile or something usually falls under archaea because uh, the plasma membrane integrity is high and breaking down of the plasma membrane is very difficult right so this side chains can even bond to each other and confer more stability to the uh, plasma membrane Whereas the fatty acids of bacteria and eukaryotes do not have the side bran branches. So what they can do is the best they can manage is a slight bend in the middle. Okay. Uh, and also car carbon ring formation uh, can happen here. Here uh, this isoprene chains can form a carbon ring uh, which will also confer more stability. You know that then a branched chain uh, breaking a ring will be much more difficult. So they can also form rings conferring much more stability to the plasma membrane and that is why archaeal membranes are very tough uh, to the environmental conditions and they mostly uh, uh, tend to be extremophiles. Is this clear about archaeal membrane or still there is any doubt regarding this archaeal membrane? I discussed this topic just because there was a question in the discussion forum. And also in the end of last lecture, I have also explained about a topoisomerase. Uh, there was also one question in the discussion forum regarding topoisomerase. Okay. So from then here we'll move on to the next question. I guess all these questions should be pretty easy here now because it deals with the diversity of microbes. Right. 
oxygenic photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide because that will be the carbon source when it's going to be autotrophic in most cases another easy question Okay, the answer is B for this question. I'll just give a few minutes for you to think and come up with why it is true or why it is false, maybe in the chat box itself. I think there is one B in the answer. Just come up with some reasons why you chose a particular option. This is just a discussion session. There is no hard and fast rule that you have to tell only the right answer. Just whatever you, uh, whatever from whatever point of view you told the answer, just give that in simple few few words or a sentence. Energy is equal to 6, 8 to 6 in case of inorganic compound, okay. I'll wait for one more person who told it's A. B is the right answer. I guess Shagurta Khan answered B and she has given why she chose B. Someone else who thought it was A and why you chose A. Yeah, if you find it difficult to type, you can even unmute and tell.
anyone else or should i move with explaining the answer it will be better if any one of you who told a or b maybe whatever you think is the right answer give ma'am yeah can i answer ma'am the oxidation of the glucose always generate a higher energy as compared to the other molecule so i answer that uh, the b1 right right so two people in favor of b i think there were people who told a right just justify like maybe it's right maybe it's wrong now you know it's wrong but still just justify why you told a okay maybe you thought inorganic molecules generate more energy than organic molecules okay okay should i go on with explaining this question or uh, okay i'll just explain it for once if someone hasn't understand what this question is and how it's give me a second i'll just okay this was the question right uh, so in this question um the answer is false because in chemo heterotropy what happens is uh, inorganic molecules um, generally uh, there happens this electron transport chain right any anywhere if it's going to be aerobic there is going to be electron transport chain so in that what happens is when we are going to have a inorganic molecule uh, we saw that redox tower Uh, in one session, right? So in that redox tower, you know, uh, glucose has the highest donor. Okay, uh, so glucose will be the um, highest donor. So when it's going to be some other compound, uh, it's going to be anyways lesser. Uh, in the redox tower, it's going to be uh, below glucose in terms of electron donation. So what happens is. when it's uh, going to be lesser obviously the energy is going to be lesser so the energy tapped in during chemo heterotrophy from inorganic molecules is more than that from glucose is false it will obviously be less than from uh, glucose so only for uh, to answer or to know about these type of questions this uh, uh, redox tower part was taught i guess uh, this is clear and like we'll move on to the next question now
so does metabolic similarity map well with functional similarity in microorganisms i see only one response here Think about what is metabolism, what is functional similarity and diversity. Are you people trying or uh, do you need the answer for this? Okay, answer. What's so confusing here? Answer is true. Right, answer is true, Shabukta Kanya, it's A. Metabolic similarity frequently maps well with functional similarity because see, um, as when given in a particular environment, uh, microbes undergo a certain kind of metabolism like aerobic conditions or a halophilic condition or a thermophilic condition. So based on the condition, it's just uh, extremophiles are just example, but in even in normal environment, whatever food you give based on that microbes grow, like whatever food they get based on that microbes grow. So there is a particular metabolic pattern. Similarly, uh, there is a there is that function of that microbe, what it does. Um, maybe uh, in our point of view, maybe in, in industrial terms, we see uh, there is some microbe that helps in pollution abatement or abatement of certain types of uh, molecules that we call pollutant how does that happen basically because that microbe is capable of breaking down that pollutant for its purpose okay so it has some enzymes that could break down that particular pollutant uh, and for us the problem is solved for microbe also there is a uh, food okay so uh, in, in this con context, if I have to explain in environmental context, uh, when there is a, for example, when I tell you there is some BOD in some wastewater or something, and we are adding in some particular microbes, for us, uh, for us, the aim is to reduce the BOD in the wastewater so that we can use it for our purposes. For microbes, there it requires some organic matter or something as its carbon source, energy source or something for its survival, okay? So, uh, based on whatever we give, the metabolism of the microbe will alter. It, it will produce enzymes su such that it can consume that particular substrate or it can produce uh, en enzymes uh, that will make it tolerant to a particular condition and so that it can grow in that condition, right? So that is how metabolism of the organism is structured. In our point of view, that is what is the functional uh, characteristic of that microbe. So metabolic similarity frequently maps well with the functional similarity in microbes. That is why the statement is true. Uh, is it clear?
should i repeat or okay i guess it's clear so i'll move on to the next question This is kind of a trivia question. So it has its own reasons and stuff, but still. Okay, there is one answer. Okay. the main lecture videos of uh, this week you have seen enough about the characteristic of many different kind of microbes in the environment right so think of that and for this question is such a simple Ask since you are thinking so much for the answer. I will display the answer in a few minutes. I will wait for few people to respond and display the answer. But the reason for this, I uh, will tell it in the next session. So before that, few people can think. And if you come up with certain reasons why a particular choice will be the answer for this question, you can come up and we will discuss about that in the next class with your opinions. I am just opening up the questions right now. You can again go back to your lecture, see and then maybe come up with a reason. And for now you can just give your answers. Okay, I guess there is no clue what uh, characteristic of the bacteria makes it survive in a hot spring. So the answer here is the green sulfur bacteria is most likely not to be found in a hot spring. Uh, we'll discuss the answer in the next live session, the next week, okay? So before that, I will request you all to go back and see what are the properties of these bacteria and uh, why green sulfur bacteria is most likely not to be found in a hot spring. Is that fine? Okay. Okay, now enough of confusing question. This is a pretty straightforward and simple question.
a genetic marker is used for building a phylogenetic tree should be universally present in all bacteria okay three people are telling it's true how about others it's a pretty straightforward question right leave it microbiological context someone raised your hand so Okay, right. Yeah, it is. And what is that genetic marker that is generally used? The basic logic for this question is when you are going to compare something, when you are going to compare a relationship between something, you need something, some factor that is uniform. Then only you can compare. Right. So that's why this statement is true. And what is that genetic marker that is widely used? I think this was discussed in the lectures lecture videos based on a particular biomolecule this uh, comparison happens and that is the genetic marker what is a genetic marker can someone name That's a very simple answer. SSU RRNA. Vaishnavi, can you expand what is SSU RRNA? I'm sorry, I think there are two Vaishnavis here. Vaishnavi Jagtap uh, has answered SSU RRNA and RFLP. No, that is not RFLP. Vaishnavi is somewhere closer. We basically use one RRNA. Uh, yeah, Pallavi, you are right. That is 16S RRNA. It's the genetic marker based on which generally this contraception of this phylogenetic tree or identification of this bacteria happens. Okay, so these are some basic informations that throughout this course you have to have in your mind. Okay, okay, with that, we are moving on to the next question. Very simple question, and I expect answers very fast here. Yeah. One answer, right? Okay, how much many confusing questions? Some straightforward questions. Oxidative phosphorylation happens in cellular respiration. Okay, I assume all of you think it's A and it is A because in cellular respiration, um, there is this aerobic condition and the phosphorylation occurring there will be oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so here there is a problem. Um, it states that there is a conversion of glucose 1 phosphate to glucose 6 phosphate. Okay, uh, so yeah, basically position change of 
phosphate from first position to sixth position in glucose. That's the reaction. Uh, the main information that we require is the uh, Ka equilibrium of this reaction is 17 uh, and uh, I am giving you the condition that the reaction is happening at 38 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere pressure with a concentration of the product being uh, 1 into 10 to the power minus 4 moles and uh, the reactant being 3 into 10 to the power minus 5 moles. Okay. So, I expect you to calculate the del G in calories per mole. The change in Gibbs free energy. I'll give you pretty some time to work out this problem. I guess you all know how to uh, start about with this problem, right? Is there anyone who doesn't know how to start, get started with this problem? Okay, I assume all of you are working out with this problem. I'll give you some time to solve this and tell me the answer.
just a quick clarification uh, you people are trying and solving it right i'll i'll wait for a few thumbs up so that i'll give you some more time if i see some thumbs up Okay, one person wants me to explain. How about others? Are you people trying? Okay, I assume you are trying and I'll just wait for a few more minutes. Someone is trying, let them come up with answers. Yeah, I will solve it in a few minutes. I'll just wait for a few minutes to check out if someone's trying. And if, it, if they are able to come up with answers. In the meanwhile, you can just go through the formula that was discussed in the last session. I think I have uploaded the even the PowerPoint of all this in a drive and the link is shared with you people. It's just a very simple formula for this question. Okay, now let me know if someone gets, got started with the problem. Like, what do you think is the formula or how did you approach? You can even unmute and tell me because there is a question in front of you and you know certain aspects of this that was discussed previously so seeing this what was the first formula or what was the first step that came to your mind this is just to uh, see if you people are uh, at least able to get the context of the question you people went blank seeing the question or something would have struck your mind right like this is the way that we have to proceed with the question anything like that it's just a discussion forum like the purpose of this whole session to our session is to discuss with you people so you can just come up and tell me even if it's wrong that doesn't matter you can just tell me how you approached this Right, del G formula. Obviously, that's the only formula that's going to relate this. Then, did you people get del G not value? Was that the pro problem in this entire question?
I guess there is R, there is T, there is K equilibrium, you can find Q. Right, Pallavi, RT LNK is equal to change in Gibbs free energy. Okay, uh, that is that straightforward, then answer is pretty straight, right? RT LNK is equal to change in Gibbs free energy. I just asked you about change in Gibbs free energy only. You people think some data is extra, some data is missing? Okay. So can I assume you are confused what to do with the concentrations? Okay, if that's the case, you just, if you think it's extra, you could have gone without those values. Okay, okay, I think this is enough of discussion and I'll just post the answers here. Okay, now I'll explain, okay. So first of all, what uh, what is was the formula that we discussed in the last class was del G is equal to del G naught plus 2.303 RT log K or um, it's just simply RT ln K. Okay, uh, so this is the formula for with which you can calculate the del G that was asked. The only problem with this is you don't know the del G naught. So let me first explain all this is from a chemical point of view. I have, uh, uh, this is glucose 1 phosphate, glucose 6 phosphate, all we know are biochemical molecules. But still this is from a chemistry point of view, right? Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I asked you to find del G for this particular condition, 38 degrees Celsius, 1 atmosphere pressure and then the concentration is this. Uh, so, to find this, what's the method is, you have to have the standard Gibbs free energy. Standard Gibbs free energy is at 1 atmosphere pressure, considering the concentrations as 1 mole and the temperature as 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, at, with this standard, you have to add what is the variation now. So, the variation will be in terms of the temperature and uh, the con concentration of the constituent. So, that is the uh, variation. So, when you are going to add that with this uh, standard, uh, you will get the answer for what will be the Gibbs free energy in the given particular uh, process condition. So, to find the standard, what you have to do is, um, this is the formula. Uh, at equilibrium condition, uh, this del G value will become 0, right? when I'm going to assume it's equilibrium and this K value will be the K equilibrium. This K value will be the K equilibrium value of that reaction. Okay. I hope you understand. I'll repeat that De uh, del G is equal to zero at equilibrium and K is equal to K equilibrium. If I'm going to relate both, what happens is del G naught will become minus 2.303 RT log K equilibrium. Okay. So the K equilibrium value is given here. So with that in mind, what you have to do is you just have to substitute K equilibrium value, find the del G naught value here and apply that del G naught value here. And uh, it's again 2.303 RT, the T for this reaction is uh, 30, uh, 38. As you can see here, I have given this is a standard uh, like equilibrium condition, right? Standard condition, del G naught value. So what I have done is I have taken 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin here. Uh, okay, I think there is a confu confusion here with this 19 and 17. I guess it was 17 here. I, uh, this is a typing error. I am sorry for that. Uh, consider this a 17 in this slide and the calculations are right. Okay, uh, so here it's minus 2.303 into R. I have told you to calculate in calories per mole. So the R value will be 1.98. The temperature will be 25 degrees Celsius. So it's 298 Kelvin. And then uh, log K equilibrium value. Again, 
uh, take this as 17 okay so with that you will get this answer and from that what you have to do is del g is equal to del g naught plus 2.303 r again 1.98 uh, given 38 degrees celsius so it will be 311 uh, kelvin and k value will be uh, 10 to the power minus 4 which is the product okay product concentration divided by the reactant concentration we are going to get that that will be the del g value is this clear Okay, when uh, given such type of problems, just think of what, how to go about with the problem and do. Okay, from now on, I just have a few blank ended questions because enough of questions that were given with options. I guess you people are pretty smart and most of the time you get right answers. Again, uh, having said this is an open ended question, it can have multiple answers. Many may be right. So just give your answers. And when while discussing the answer for this question, whatever from my perspective was right, I just gave those in the blanks as answers. Uh, Maybe you, more than one answer can be there which you feel is right. So I'll make a note of that and when I upload the PPT, I'll include that and upload. Okay. It's a very similar question that, that uh, we have discussed some time ago. Okay, pretty much with that, it's inorganic compound. Uh, H2S is again an inorganic compound, so you have answered it right. The whole purpose of this open net questions uh, is, is to make you think in a direction that leads to the answer and also to let you know that there can be multiple ways of going about certain questions. Okay. and kind of it will break the monotony maybe in the sessions so the next question is anamoxis people who have gone through the lecture i guess you can easily answer this question within minutes
right anamox is basically comes in the nitrogen cycle for nitrogen removal and it is anamox stands for anaerobic ammonium oxidation so it's anamox so that's what the name again you have given the right answer so i'll consider all the other options that are not present here in the answers and i'll upload it while uploading the ppt for your references okay fine next question again a similar question to what we have discussed earlier we discussed about metabolic diversity and functional diversity so this is kind of a similar question right lena singh yeah that was the right answer for the previous question two similar answers yeah okay i guess others would also agree to this phylogenetically similar microbes may be functionally dissimilar so phylogenetic similarity doesn't always mean that functionally they are similar they are may be functionally dissimilar and the next question i guess this is a pretty easy question for you all because uh, i guess most of you are from biological background only uh maybe my intention of this question was what is an what does an enteric bacteria mean if that is not clear in this question for causing bacteria okay right we have different answers right lena saying the way you try to connect things is uh, exactly right and all other answers are also right enteric bacteria is basically found in intestinal tracts uh, so that is what we called as enteric portion um okay and the next question here posed can it be harmful or can it be useful 
enteric bacteria are uh, generally are they harmful or are they useful More useful, okay. Right. So uh, that was the whole purpose of this kind of question, just to make you think in certain way, so that you don't go uh, approach a particular question in a very defined manner. Okay. So yeah, uh, the way in which you told that enteric bacteria uh, starting from connecting it from typhoid enteric fever to getting to know what it means and uh, now this answer it can be harmful useful both so as told gut bacteria we know gut microbiome is one of the richest microbiome uh, found in the whole planet we have whole diverse organisms present in our gut we have both uh, useful and harmful because without the gut microbiome uh, we cannot survive and uh, you know there are many research uh, going on in the uh, about the gut microbiome okay how it affects um, other metabolic processes in human and stuff also on the other hand we know few e coli um, that causes uh, this enteric diseases as told uh, salmonella typhi is a bacterium um, which can affect this gut health so it can be harmful or useful right next question this is again a very easy memory based question if you have gone through the lectures Okay, there is one answer. How about others? Okay, two now. Okay, maybe others are confused. Okay. Sweet potatoes, yeah. Might be, but out of our context now. Let's confine the discussion to applied environmental microbiology. Okay, yeah. Okay. Purple non sulfur bacteria. Basically, it is a photo heterotroph. So, if you could have told photo heterotroph, it's partially maybe right. 
but purple dots are papilla is the exact right answer it's not always purple and produces an array of carotenoids see it's basically a, a question that tests your memory nothing else you you would have obviously been confused between whether it's a purple sulfur bacteria or a purple non sulfur bacteria right so it's a purple non sulfur bacteria based on um, if you have seen the lecture videos you would have known this okay Again, a memory based question. Okay, there is one answer. Other people, are you agreeing it's consortium or are you thinking what the answer is? I guess this question is a bit tricky for you. We are taking some long time compared to other questions. Okay, with that one response that I got, Nidhi Praveen, what is a consortium bacterium, by the way? Did you read the entire statement given there? Green sulfur bacteria form intimate two-membered associations with a dash bacteria. Right, I, just, I guess you just saw intimate two-membered association and then gave consortium because it was missing in the question. Right, that happens. Okay, so organotrophic bacteria, and yeah, as you told, I also mentioned that word in the answer. And this uh, intimate two-membered association can also be called as a consortium. Okay, uh, and uh, in this consortium, there will be benefit for both the organisms, like a metabolic benefit maybe for a green sulfur bacteria and the chemo organotrophic. Uh, bacteria. So that is how basically consortium is formed. They all coexist. You could have find, uh, found out in many um, environmental treatment techniques like when you are going to use a biological techniques they tell a consortium of microbes was added for this particular technique. So that's the whole point of this question. Again, an easy question would have been more easy if I, if I had given four options here. Just few minutes left for the for closing the session. I guess the people can answer. Hydrospora strains, okay. Hmm. 
Okay. Okay. So basically, ammonia oxidizers and nitrite oxidizers. There is a difference between these two, and uh, the nitrifiers will be the microbes here. So what they will be doing is they will be able to live chemolithotropically by utilizing ammonia. This will be the second question for today upon which you will think, okay, I will upload this question uh, along with the PPT when I do that. So previously I uh, told you to think upon one question and this both these questions we will discuss for sure in the um, next session, okay. And I have not revealed the answer for this question here. Uh, to just think upon and tell me a generalized uh, answer for this in the next session and I'll come up with a proper explanation, like with, with the proper time for the explanation and explain it in the next session. Okay, the last question for the day. Very simple memory based question to end this session. Okay. Okay. Right, uh, based on the context of this session, it's abiotic predator. Abiotic predators attach to the surface of the prey and acquire nutrients from the cytoplasm and periplasm. Right, predatory bacteria, yeah. In particular, it is abiotic predators. Okay, with that, we come to the end of the third live session for the Applied Environmental Microbiology course. Um, I guess the session was useful um the same question as the previous two weeks uh do these types yes gate in gate again you will be having questions that uh, test your analytical skills you have i guess you are aware that um uh, gate has this numerical type answer questions, multiple select questions and uh, multiple uh, choice questions. So in, in multiple choice questions, what happens is uh, you are given questions out of four options. One option will be right. But in multiple select questions, that's not the case. More than one options can be right. So only if you select all the right options, you will be marked. Otherwise, there is no negative marking for such questions, but still you will not be marked. Uh, for example, there are four options given out of which three are right. You choose uh, only two options that are right. 
still you will not be marked because you left that one option so you have to be precisely right about all the three options okay so that is why i also have a mix and match of questions here and there and uh, regarding gate at least here we know what way what the scope of this course is confined to uh, i may sometimes have uh, some questions that are about par but still i um, take care that i don't exceed the scope of this course but in uh, gate as in you just have a syllabus so you will you can get questions from any part related to this course only yeah because like uh, here the motto of this course is uh, to teach you how to apply the knowledge of microbiology in environment right so the course is applied environmental microbiology wherein um, you are expected to have the knowledge of microbiology uh, and uh, see how the environmental aspect of this uh, course proceeds uh, with application in it, in its mind okay so you are you are going to basically uh, learn about how to apply environmental microbiology so that is where is the motto of this course is so keeping that in mind uh, all this basic microbiology topics that uh, we have seen so far like uh, maybe uh, the structure maybe the energetics are all very important in terms of gate also okay uh, i guess the session was useful and uh, i hope to continue uh, asking such type of questions in a future sessions also based on whatever the lecture lectures are covered and whatever the scope of the lesson is it fine for all of you or uh, if you have some suggestions you can just put it out in the chat box okay right i see a lot of thumbs up and it's already 9 now uh, one more uh, uh, thing to tell you before leaving is that if you have any questions you can post it in the discussion forum i will just have a look of uh, the discussion forum but uh, uh, it's a personal request that you can post it around on um, saturday sundays before saturday sunday so that i also have proper time to uh, look into the questions and then incorporate those uh, in a slides that i prepare for discussion it will benefit you and uh, me both of us uh, so as told um, i guess i have to upload uh, one question right okay i think pallavi pallavi was the person who asked that question i Maybe I'll try to incorporate uh, how to work on it in this PPT itself and then upload it uh, where you can see in the announcement sections. Okay. Okay, right. With that, uh, we can close the session now. Thank you. Thank you all for joining in and being so interactive.